Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Candace Tannis. I'm an assistant professor of environmental medicine and public health here at Mount Sinai. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Institute for Exposomic Research's Environment and Health Series. For the next six weeks, every Wednesday at one o'clock, you will hear from leading scientists who are studying the health impacts of complex environmental exposures. This series is designed to be relevant to you, to your daily life, and to empower you with new information that's coming out of the latest research. And it's also about how you can protect yourself from harmful exposures in the environment. We have made many extraordinary strides in understanding how all of the complex environmental factors around us affect our health and our risk for disease. This include, for example, the air that we breathe or the chemicals in the products that we buy and can also include where we live. Exposomics, which you will learn about today, is a scientific approach that allows us to study the environment in ways never before possible. We are reconstructing past exposures, such as those experienced in utero and in early life. And we're also understanding how those exposures shape our future health trajectory. As a physician, I'm particularly excited about today's presentation, which will explore how we can translate this science to better serve our patients and the community at large. Today's presentation will be about 25 minutes and it will be followed by about 20 minutes for audience questions. I encourage you to submit your questions using the Q&A function. And if we can't get to them all today, and I hope you all have many questions, we will work to get your answers shared. We'll work to get you answers and get those answers shared on social media. So with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Wright. He's the co-director of the Institute for Exposomic Research and the chair of our Department of Environmental Medicine and Public Health here at Mount Sinai. Dr. Wright is a pediatrician and he's a toxicologist and he, lead, he leads a team of transdisciplinary environmental health researchers, epidemiologists, data scientists, and physicians such as myself. I'm honored to be a part of this team. One of the things that I do is I treat patients who are enrolled in the WTC health program, um, particularly our first responders who were ex exposed to a complex toxic mixture after the September 11th attacks more than 20 years ago. Dr. Wright is a leading advocate for the expansion of exposomic research. The range of what is being studied under his leadership is vast. We do a lot of things like childhood diseases, like asthma and autism, all the way up to conditions, including obesity, diabetes, cancers, and Alzheimer's, which is more typically associated with adults. I am delighted to introduce him to you today. And Dr. Wright, the floor is yours. Thank you, Candace. So thank you and welcome everyone. Um, I'm very honored to kick off this series. This is the second year we've done this. Um, today, I'm going to talk about how exposomics might one day become part of your physician visit, whether it's for your children, your pediatrician, or whether it's for yourself. So I paraphrased a um, Joyce Carol Oates short story called Where Are You Going, Where Have You Been? to um, sort of get to where we're going and where we've been and how the two are related. So most diseases are actually complex. And this is something that's only been appreciated really within the last 30 years. Uh, before that, we tended to think of diseases as having a single cause. And this is because the really common uh, diseases and the ones that actually cause the more, most uh, fatalities and chronic diseases were actually single cause diseases like infections and trauma. But with improvements in our public health infrastructure, uh, those diseases actually aren't as common as they used to be, and they're not the major causes of uh, healthcare costs in this country. And while those diseases and also rare genetic diseases, like, such as uh, cystic fibrosis, have single causes or relatively small numbers of causes, the vast majority of diseases have very complicated uh, causes. And 
these causes can be both genetic and environmental. And in fact, pretty much everything that's not an infection, trauma, or a rare um, genetic Mendelian disease like cystic fibrosis actually is a complex disease. So these include uh, the most common diseases that affect ourselves and our children, including autism, asthma, renal failure, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, heart attacks, strokes, et cetera, et cetera. All of those are complex diseases, meaning they all have many, many different causes that are both genetic and environmental. So against this backdrop, um, the field of medicine is moving towards what is called precision medicine. So precision, precision medicine is mainly practiced as pharmacogenomics. In other words, they're looking at how genetics may help uh, physicians actually increase drug efficacy by targeting, patient, tar targeting the drugs to the patients based on their genome, which might decrease toxicity. Um, the idea is that it would also decrease exposure to ineffective drugs, and it might target therapy of the most effective drugs, and perhaps even have behavioral modifications based on individual genetic risk factors. And if it's successful, it would improve counseling and decision-making, uh, improve patient outcomes and satisfaction, and improve tolerance of therapy, and therefore compliance or adherence to the therapy. But the problem is, because it's being practiced primarily as pharmacogenomics, it would only work if genetics is really what's causing all of our diseases. But we know genetics is only one piece of a much, much bigger puzzle. And in fact, we've known this for a very long time. 20 years ago, the science, um, the journal Science, which is really probably the top journal in all biological research, actually published a whole issue that was devoted to what are the causes of complex diseases. Uh, and if you look carefully at the cover, uh, you see things like smoking, pollution, viruses, and diet, as well as genes. Uh, and in fact, the whole issue was devoted to all the different potential causes. And so there was a section on genetics, but there were also sections on behavior, nutrition, infections, chemicals, physical environment, culture, society, and stress. And in fact, the introduction to that issue was actually entitled, It's Not Just the Genes. And yet, for some reason, we've moved more and more towards genetics and away from these other causes that are non-genetic. And in fact, if you were to peruse um, websites for precision medicine programs at other institutions, you see a sort of uniformity in terms of how they're constructed. Almost all of them have some picture of DNA. And the idea is they all talk about genes that cause diseases being targets for drugs that will help them have more precise outcomes. Uh, almost none of them mention environment. Here's another example where the DNA is shown here's a double helix and they're showing different drugs that can actually be used or different doses of drugs that can be used based on genetics. And here's one instead of being horizontally uh, oriented, it's actually vertically oriented, but it's basically the same concept uh, all about genetics and DNA testing. And yet we already know that genetics does not explain all the reasons why we get sick or all the reasons why we may have treatment failures or successes. So I'm a Joyce Carol Oates fan, but I'm also a Talking Heads fan. Uh, David Byrd um, from the song Once in a Lifetime asked the question, so how did we get here? So complex diseases, uh, which I listed a few of them beforehand, they include things like ADHD, obesity, um, attention uh, deficit hyperactivity disorder, obesity, asthma, COPD, um, Parkinson's disease, almost all the cancers are also complex diseases. We know that the causes are actually a mixture of genetics and environmental risk factors. A lot of these diseases are actually becoming more and more prevalent. Autism is becoming more prevalent, asthma is becoming more prevalent, obesity is becoming more prevalent as is Parkinson's and, and um, Alzheimer's disease. Genetics cannot explain rising rates of disease. Genetics, remember, you have to inherit your genes from your parents, it, and multiple generations actually have to pass before genetics can cause an increase or a decrease in a disease because it has to, whatever genetic factors, the quote unquote cause, has to spread across a, a population. And that just can't happen in 20, 30, or 40 years. So any increase that we've seen in any disease in the last 20, 30, or 40 years cannot be due to genetics. Environmental risk factors, which are the uh, explanation for these rising rates, are pretty much largely unidentified. We know some of them. We certainly know that smoking causes lung cancer, for example, but we don't know all the various uh, environmental risk factors. 
And in fact, the language that we use in science often um, creates this dichotomy where we have to study either genetics, which is nature, or nurture, which is environment. Um, even, we even do studies that are called heritability estimates, which try to parse out what percent of a disease is genetic, what percent is environmental, uh, when in fact, there is no real genetic, truly genetic disease or truly environmental disease because all diseases actually occur because of interactions between genes and environment. And uh, I'll try to show you this in a moment. By the way, um, if you're interested, I do write a blog on our exposomic website, and I actually have a blog about this very issue of why uh, nature versus nurture is actually not a particularly good way to look at uh, how diseases occur. So why don't we try to take a step back and understand where this comes from? So why, why do we call diseases genetic or environmental? Well, some of it actually is perception. So let's take my previous statement that all diseases are due to interactions between genes and environment. And if we assume that's true, what is the appearance of the cause of a disease in two different uh, scenarios? One is when the genetic polymorphism is rare and the environmental factor is common. And in that situation, a disease will actually appear to be genetic, even though it's due to a gene environment interaction. If the converse is true, if the environmental factor is rare and the genetic polymorphism is common, that disease will appear to be environmental, even though it's actually due to a gene environment interaction. Now, this is a concept that's difficult to illustrate in humans, but it's actually kind of easy to de uh, demonstrate in chickens. So there's actually a trait in chickens called yellow shanks, and this is a discoloration of their legs if they have a particular genetic variant and they eat yellow corn as opposed to eating white corn. And the genetic trait actually follows an autosomal dominant pattern, meaning you only have one copy uh, of the genetic factor in order to develop yellow shanks. So I'll imagine there are two farmers, Farmer Jones and Farmer Smith, and they live down the road from each other. Both of them have inbred chicken flocks. In Farmer Jones' flock, all the chickens carry the genetic variant for yellow shanks. He feeds them white corn because long ago, his great-great-grandfather discovered that if he gave yellow corn, they would get chicken shanks. So he always told his, his descendants that they should always feed white corn. One day, the store runs out. So Farmer Jones feeds yellow corn to his chickens, and all of them get yellow shanks. If you were to ask what causes yellow shanks in Farmer Jones, he would tell you it's yellow corn. It's environmental. If chickens eat yellow corn, they get yellow shanks. Down the road, there's Farmer Smith. He also has an inbred chicken flock. They do not carry the, vari the genetic variant for yellow shanks. Yellow corn's a little bit cheaper, so he's always fed them yellow corn. One day, one of his chickens gets yellow shanks. Farmer Smith is an amateur geneticist, and he notices if that chicken gets yellow shanks, then half of his offspring get yellow shanks. And he draws a pedigree, which is a way uh, to determine uh, the, the genetics of uh, various traits. And he determines that yellow shanks is actually a genetic trait that follows an autosomal dominant pattern. From a biological perspective, the exact same thing is happening in in Farmer Jones's chickens as Farmer Smith's chickens. The perception because of the distribution of the environmental factor and the genetic factor is so different in the two populations is that in one case, yellow shanks is environmental and in the other case, it's genetic and yet the exact same thing is happening in both. So if we believe that this is happening in humans and there's many, many reasons to believe that this happens in humans. So, do we think yellow shanks is environmental or genetic? Or if cancer follows similar patterns of genes and environment interaction, interacting, such as in lung cancer, is cancer environmental or genetic? By the same token, diseases that we think of as being purely genetic, phenylketonuria is one of them. So all children are tested for phenylketonuria shortly, shortly after birth, because if you have the genetic variants for phenylketonuria and you're able to uh, keep phenylalanine, out of your diet, which is a environmental amino acid, you can actually prevent you know, the neurotoxicity that occurs in children who have this particular gen genetic trait. But even though we think of it as genetic, there is an environmental component, phenylalanine, which is mandatory for you to get the disease. And in fact, if we prevent exposure to phenylalanine, we prevent the disease. So technically, is phenylketonuria really genetic, or is it environmental, or is it a combination of both?
right? All diseases, even those diseases that we think of as genetic are actually a combination of both. And in fact, if we think about dividing the percent of um, chicken, chicken shanks or yellow shanks that's due to genes or environment, um, depending on whether we did it in Farmer Jones's flock or Farmer Smith's flocks, we would get radically different answers. We would get 100% environmental in one case and 100% genetic in the other. So perhaps this whole concept of dividing uh, traits or diseases into a percent that's genetic and a percent that environmental is actually very, very subjective because all genes operate in, in variable environmental backgrounds. And those backgrounds are really big. In fact, that's what the exposome is all about, whether it's the social environment, the nutritional environment, the chemical environment, or the physical environment. The exposome really encompasses all of the different environments that we experience throughout our lifetime. It's really not just the chemicals. So here's some examples of precision medicine. So I wanted to talk to you about how this might be incorporated into your uh, medical care one day. So this is actually example, an example that's found on several of those um, um, websites I showed you earlier from different institutions that have precision medicine programs. A 53-year-old develops a deep venous thrombosis, so that's a blood clot, on a trans-Pacific flight. So if you're very, uh, if you keep your leg very still and you're cooped up in, on a plane for 10 to 12 hours, um, sometimes you get a, a blood clot, a DVT. Um, she gets treated with this with a blood thinner called warfarin and she develops a GI bleed. Well, a genomic screen would have determined that she had a genetic variant that actually made her a slow metabolizer of warfarin. And if they had done a genomic scan beforehand, they would have reduced her dose and she wouldn't develop this complication. So that's a great example of how genomics in some cases actually can be very important for precision medicine. But what about this case? A 17-year-old child has autism. It has a notable increase in head banging and anger outbursts. Now, autism is kind of famously thought to be genetic. So as I told you earlier, I don't believe any diseases are 100% genetic or 100% environmental. They're actually due to interaction of them. And in fact, if you did a genome scan on this child with autism, you wouldn't find any reason to, that would explain why he's having an increase in head banging. And in fact, remember, he's 17 years old. These are new symptoms. So if it was something he was born with, his, his genome sequence hasn't changed in his 17 years. It's the same as the day you're conceived as the day you die. So that can't possibly be a cause. Well, it turned out he actually had lead poisoning. So this was a case from about 20 years ago when I worked in a lead clinic at Boston Children's Hospital. Um, his blood lead level was quite high. He was 73, and it turned out he was eating newspaper, and newspaper ink has a little bit of lead in it, and if he, if he ate a lot of newspaper, he got lead poisoned. Uh, and the reason he was eating a lot of newspaper is because he has autism and kids with autism often have something called pica, where they eat non-food substances. So he tended to eat newspaper and we were able to both treat him for the lead poisoning with chelation. Uh, and then obviously uh, his parents stopped having newspaper in the house and his blood lead became uh, back to normal and his symptoms went away. So that's an example where a genome scan would not have diagnosed that patient. Uh, here's another example. So a newborn infant uh, in Iowa is blue. That's what cyanosis means, and he's, but he's otherwise behaving normally. We think maybe he has a congenital heart disease, something potentially genetic, but he has an echocardiogram. He has a normal heart. Well, he has a problem that's called methemoglobinemia, with his, which is oxidation of the hemoglobin in your blood, uh, which causes it not to be able to hold as much oxygen, and so you turn blue. And um, if 100% of your blood is methemoglobinemia, uh, that wouldn't be compatible with life because you wouldn't be able to transport any oxygen. In his case, it was 24%. Um, his five and 10-year-old siblings did not have methemoglobinemia. They all drank from the same water, but the difference was because he was a newborn, he was less able to metabolize uh, the, the um, fertilizer runoff uh, in this rural uh, Iowa farm. That actually was oxidizing uh, his blood. His body was not able to handle that, whereas older people and adults are actually able to handle that. And his susceptibility was actually because he was an infant. A genome scan would not have actually detected this either. In another example, a 14-year-old who has reflux, so he's um, um, refluxing in his esophagus, um, he's being treated for that, and he breaks his arm, and he gets morphine for the pain, and he goes into a very, very deep sleep. Um, he might have a genetic variant that actually makes him a slow morphine metabolizer, but in this case, he did not uh, because um, 
he had GE reflux, he's being treated with Tagamet, which is an over-the-counter uh, medication that actually inhibits um, some of the enzymes that metabolize morphine. And let's say he had uh, problems with depression, he might be on Paxil, which also will inhibit it, and the two combined would actually make him more susceptible. Uh, and had he done uh, exposomic screen, it would have been detected that he had both Tagamet um, and Paxil in his uh, bloodstream, and that might actually have prompted the physician to give a lower dose of morphine. But a genome scan would not have prompted that because it wouldn't have revealed any of that. And so that gets, brings me to the difference between public health research and medical research. Most of the research that we do is actually public health, which is very, very important. Uh, and we want to be able to prevent diseases from occurring. But there's this whole area of research in which precision medicine lives, in which environmental health hasn't lived. And that's um, after a disease is present. So in this particular graph, if the x-axis is time, there's a time in your life before you have a particular disease, and there's a time in your life in most cases after you have the disease. Prevention research gets conducted before people have the disease. Even studies that are looking at the causes are maybe comparing people with the disease and people without to see whether or not some, some risk factors are more common in people with the disease. But for precision medicine, when you want to understand how to best treat people, you really just look at people who have a disease and you give different treatments, whether those are drugs or whether those are surgery, and you see how those drugs affect the disease onset. Well, environmental factors might actually explain why some people have more complications to a particular treatment, particularly drugs, but they are almost never studied in the context of the presence of the disease. Almost all of the research that we do in environmental health is about how an environmental factor might cause a disease. It's a subtle difference, but there's a lot of research that needs to be done in how environmental factors affect people who have a disease. So think about that case that I showed earlier about the child with autism. He had lead poisoning and it made his autism worse. I don't believe the lead poisoning caused his autism, but once you have autism, you live in the same environment as everybody else, and you might get exposed to lead, and lead is neurotoxic. So therefore, you might be more susceptible to a relatively lower dose of autism, or in this case, being more exposed um, to, to lead. And so we need to start thinking about whether or not some of these environmental toxicants actually are affecting children who already have a disease, because there's something we can do about that. We can actually reduce their exposure, and that might actually make their disease less severe. And that's a whole field of research that really is sort of wide open at this stage. It really hasn't been explored well. And then because we're the Institute for Exposomics, um, we like to study as many chemicals as possible. So this is actually the output from one of our instruments that shows the thousands of chemicals that are inside our body. This was a blood sample and each one of these peaks, these are called chromatograms, each one of these peaks represents an individual chemical. And there's thousands and thousands of chemicals uh, inside our body uh, and inside our blood and inside our urine. And so we're starting to do the research to try to catalog what all these chemicals are. Uh, and we can actually study these peaks. We don't actually have to know what they are in advance. If we, these peaks are reproducible in multiple people, we can start to understand which peaks are the important ones uh, and start to do more research on uh, figuring out what they are and how they work. But we don't just do um, you know, chemical assays, we also look at the external environment. So we measure the effects of climate and health. So we measure temperature and weather patterns. We, expect, we measure exposure to positive things such as green space. So uh, these are uh, the different, some of the, uh, a smattering of the different external environmental factors uh, that we can measure. Next slide, please. So um, including the external environment includes uh, wearable devices. So uh, these include things like phone apps. Almost everybody on the planet actually uh, owns a cell phone now. Um, your car is probably hooked to the internet. Appliances are certainly hooked, hooked to the internet. Uh, lots of wearable devices like a, like a Garmin watch or an Apple watch are, are connected to the internet. And these exchange data uh, through the internet and some of them measure physiologic functions or some that can actually be devised to measure uh, chemicals, say in your sweat. Um, and all these things actually collect data on us. And this is part of how we're going to collect the exposome going forward is actually uh, in some cases going to be with wearable devices. Next slide, please. 
And there's even an exposomic wearable device. This is uh, relatively low tech. It's actually a silicone bracelet. Uh, it acts as a passive sampler. So you wear it for say seven days and anything in your external environment that lands on um, the bracelet gets captured. And then you send it to our laboratory and we'll run an assay on it. And we can tell you all the different chemicals that were in your environment. It's not particularly quantitative or not exactly quantitative because um, you, know, you could get a big bolus of, of soap on it uh, and whatever's in that soap will be uh, on that wristband. Um, but you might've only done that once in seven days, but it is a qualitative measurement of what's in your external environment. Next slide. So how might we operationalize it? So that um, slide I showed earlier with all the different colorful peaks called a chromatogram. Uh, one day we think that physicians will actually measure that just like they measure your, uh, will one day measure your genomic sequence uh, at each visit uh, at your physician's office. And then there'll be computers that run in the background that compute what you've been exposed to and what your genomic gen gene environment interaction risk is. And we'll predict whether or not you're at risk for a disease, or if you're getting treated for a disease, uh, what is your uh, likely response to a particular treatment to perhaps guide, uh, guide you to a better treatment. And that'll be above what most uh, precision medicine programs do because that will include both your environment and your genes. Next slide. And then one day, I think what what will happen is you'll hand off your cell phone uh, at the front desk at the office and they'll download it and they'll have your residence history. Uh, they'll have your occupational history. Occupation is actually a good predictors of environmental factors. It'll all be entered into a database and that will be linked both with your exposome assay that we talked about earlier and your genomic assay to even get a better understanding of your exposome and how that is added to your overall risk of health and disease going forward. Next slide. And here's some examples of exposome precision medicine projects. So there's very little research, as I mentioned earlier, on people who have a disease and how the environment affects it. So we think that phthalates, which are found in plastics, actually are um, toxic to the lungs. Well, people, uh, they're also obesogenic chemicals and people with cystic fibrosis um, have lung disease and they have GI problems. So what happens to them when they get exposed to phthalates? They're getting exposed to phthalates at the same rates, presumably, as everybody else on the planet. Uh, but we haven't done any research to see what's happening to them when they get exposed. If you have diabetes, there's a whole bunch of chemicals called obesogenic chemicals, uh, but include phthalates as well as PFAS and PFOA. Um, we think they're causes of diabetes. Well, there are millions of people in this country who already have diabetes. They're getting exposed to these chemicals too. What's it doing to their treatment? Is it one of the reasons why they need a higher dose of insulin or having or difficulty managing their glucose? These are questions that I think need to be studied as well as the effects of neurotoxic metals such as lead and mercury and arsenic on people with Alzheimer's disease. Perhaps we should be studying the air quality in surgical ICUs. Maybe patients will have better outcomes if, they, if we make sure that they're actually breathing air with less pollution in it. And maybe we can use some of these untargeted assays to get a better handle on diagnosis, things, diseases such as anorexia or bulimia early on, which will probably have a biochemical signature. Next slide. So in the future, exposomics are gonna enable larger and larger numbers of environmental factors to be measured. Uh, we'll analyze them as a mixture because this is closer to real life. And I think we're gonna start incorporating them into precision medicine programs, both prevention and treatment to improve the precision of those programs. Uh, to complete the puzzle, um, next slide please, that will complete the puzzle of complex diseases. And final slide, so that precision medicine programs will look more like this. Uh, this is actually a website that actually doesn't focus solely on genomics, but actually really acknowledges that there are many other risk factors that actually play into our health and that we need to measure those if we're ever gonna make precision medicine truly precise. And that's my last slide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wright. And with that, I think we will go to our Q&A. We have quite a few questions coming in. So I will try to do this in a timely and efficient manner. Um, so the first one is, can you please clarify the difference between what we think of as traditional environmental disease research and exposomic research? And maybe talk a little bit about how technology plays a role in advancing research. No, that's, um, no, that's a great question. So, um, traditional research, you know, looks at one factor at a time. Um, it's also the same difference between genetics and genomics. In genetics, 
they looked at one gene at a time and what it, you know, the genetic variant at a time and, and how it affected health. Um, the same is true of environment versus exposomics. So instead of only studying lead poisoning and design, designing an entire study around lead, we're trying to measure all the different factors that uh, a child might be exposed to and see which one of those correlate um, with behavioral performances or IQ tests so that we can get a better handle on all the factors uh, that are affecting um, um, health. And that's really the difference between environment and exposomics. You know, each study is very expensive, both in terms of the financial cost of doing a study, but also in terms of the time, not just of the researchers, but of the participants. So if we can measure more things at once, we can actually more efficiently start to weed out what things we think are good for us, what things we, we think are bad for us, so that we can actually get a better handle on, on the kinds of advice we want to give patients going forward. But that's, that's the main difference is uh, we're studying lots and lots of things in exposomics, and we're only studying essentially one thing in, in traditional environmental health. Thank you, Dr. Wright. Um, just one quick plug before we continue with the Q&A. Um, I'd like to encourage everyone to spend some time on the Sinai Exposomic website. It's sinaiexposomic.org, where we have a lot of really great resources that break down the science. And there's also a learning hub on how to reduce harmful environmental exposures in your own personal environment. Okay, so the next question we have is, there are certain data that are available to the general public that may help inform people's behavior like air quality and temperature as examples. When do you think we'll have more personalized data that could be downloaded and shared with your doctor? Uh, well, that really is gonna require uh, a major investment um, either by the healthcare industry, or, or I think more likely by companies. I think Apple and Google are starting to move into this space. Um, I think we have to be cognizant that even though they, they use our data, uh, it, that, um, because they have a lot of information on us because of cell phones having GPS trackers in them, you know, it's really our data. So we need to make sure that the laws make it clear that this is our data and we can get it back um, when we want it. And I think, um, you know, there has to be a lot of work on being able to crunch that data. If you, if you can imagine where you've been in the last week, you know, those, there are GPS coordinates for that, but that's a massive amount of information that has to be crunched. And so there's a cost to that. And so, you know, we have to start making um, investments in being able to crunch that data automatically so that it can be downloaded directly from your cell phone uh, into your medical record. Uh, and, then, and then there has to be a second sort of platform that analyzes, you know, where you've been and how that relates to the built environment of where you've been, to noise, to air pollution, to climate variables from where you've been. That is all possible, but it's going to require quite a bit of um, research and, and also just healthcare infrastructure investment. So I do think it'll one day happen. I think there are a lot of commercial forces that are actually going to drive a lot of that, but I do think this is probably the future and I would guess sometime around 10 years from now, we'll start to see uh, that actually being incorporated into medical care. Great, and it'd be interesting because I imagine on top of that, there's also going to be the HIPAA compliant piece. Yeah, there's a lot of, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, Apple and Google don't have to play by those rules, which creates actually this strange dynamic where it's easier for them to collect this kind of data than it is for a medical researcher to collect this kind of data. Um, and that's going to be something that I think there, there may be some legal issues around how to use that data going forward because of the way it's collected without technically having informed consent. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so we have another question. Sorry. So the NIH the NIH has funded um, exposomic research, but won't fund fund everything that you need. What what about looking at you know philanthropic sources? Oh well, we're obviously very very interested in that. Um, you know, a lot of times when you're trying to get started, because a lot of this work is high risk. Um, you know, philanthropy actually can fill that gap better than NIH will because, you know, NIH is a bit risk averse. Um, 
So, you know, philanthropy can, can play a big role. And I, I mean, I, I actually believe commercialization will play a big role because I think that, um, you know, people want to know the quality of the air they breathe. They want to know the quality of the food they breathe. And I think as we, you know, as we do the research that starts to show, you know, what factors are good and what factors are bad for health, um, there's going to be incentives to make this information available to people and I would predict there will be more things like phone apps and, and such that actually will help people uh, get this information. And I think commercialization will probably do a lot to get that into people's hands faster. Great. Thank you. I have another question here. Um, can you discuss how exposomics research can help us to better understand the origin of racial health inequities? Oh, great question. So health disparities and inequities, they're not due to genetics. What they're due to is environmental factors. And we know that environmental factors are not evenly distributed. The air quality in Harlem is worse than the air quality in the Upper East Side of Manhattan. The probability of living next to a Superfund toxic waste site goes up substantially based on race and ethnicity and socioeconomic status. So, what we think of as social determinants of health, those are the exposome. They're not genetics. Those are factors that exist that have been largely unmeasured. So when researchers adjust for race in a study, what they're really adjusting for isn't race, it's all of those factors that correlate with race. So it's, and that includes things like pollution and air quality and water quality and food quality. All of those things are actually what's driving um, disparities and those things are embedded in structural racism. And so the exposome is gonna do uh, enormous amounts of benefit to our society and better understanding what are the root origins of these health inequities and health disparities. Thank you very much. Um, we have one another question in the chat box. Um, using the internet um, to collect, using the internet to collect data is great. Um, is electromagnetic frequency sensitivity research in your repertoire? Um, our institution and institute uh, have not done any work in that area, but I think it is an area in which we do need uh, to start doing more research in. I think. Um, as a society, we have a tendency to assume things are safe until they're proven toxic. Um, that's really sort of what the precautionary principle is all about. And while I, I think we need to come at it with an open mind, I don't know that um, electromagnetic fields of 5Gs, let's say, or, or even greater are, are necessarily toxic. Uh, I also don't know that they're safe either. And I think we need to do the research to figure that out. Thank you very much. Let's see. Um, so we have a question about specifically the World Trade Center exposures. Is it possible that there will be new conditions that we don't know about yet that could be World Trade Center related? Oh, I think that's very true and very likely. You know, a lot of environmental factors, they do some subclinical damage when you get exposed, but, you know, the, the effect of that subclinical damage doesn't, you know, really present itself for years. I mean, you know, a, an easy example is if you had a knee injury as an athlete, as a teenager, um, you may get through you know, your 20s and 30s and maybe even your 40s without having little more than a twinge in your knee, but you may have frank arthritis by the time you're 50. So these environmental exposures set forth you on a trajectory that may not express itself um, for some, in some cases, decades. So yeah, I think uh, it's been 20 years and I think, you know, unfortunately the responders that um, worked uh, at 9-11 at, at the site um, 20 years ago, I think they're starting to see a lot more, you know, cancers and a lot more different types of health outcomes because of that. Uh, exposure because they were set on a trajectory because of uh, their, their courage and their sacrifice. Great. And that's why we always have new patients coming in. 
Um, yeah. you know, 20 years later, we have a lot of new patients who are coming in because we get more and more information that comes every year. Yeah. So um, can you speak, can you speak to how you capture uh, chemical, non-chemical exposures and incorporate them into your exposomic research? For example, things like stress and neighborhood characteristics, like access to green spaces. Yeah. Uh, some of those are captured by geospatial models. Access to green space is certainly captured that way. Um, you can also, um, you know, there, there are a lot of um, environmental stressors that actually have a geospatial distribution. Crime statistics um, have a geospatial distribution. Um, built environment, uh, how walkable is your neighborhood, whether there are parks and sidewalks versus not having sidewalks. Access to healthy foods, how far drive do you have to go? Um, how many fast food restaurants in your neighborhood? All those things are things that you can actually plot geospatially. Um, and I still think that questionnaires uh, are very, very important and, and can give you a lot of information. And I think a lot of uh, stressors are actually going to always be measured by questionnaires. One of the things that I think you're going to see going forward, though, is because we know you know, we, we're much better at plotting uh, your geospatial coordinates, say from your cell phone mm -hmm. or from your watch. Um, we could actually do research where if you're an area that has a lot of noise, like we suddenly see because of the internet of things that you know, your no the noise levels that you're exposed to go up, we can shoot you a text questionnaire about how it's affecting you. Uh, so we can get in the moment information on how an environmental factor is affecting, say, mental health status, such as anxiety or stress um, or depression even. And so I think you're going to see more and more research that actually does that, where we actually ask these questionnaires in the moment, so to speak, uh, of the environmental stressor. Thank you, Dr. Wright. And I think we have time for just one more question. Um, can you talk just a little bit about your own research and if you have any interesting news or updates on specific studies that you would like to share, we'd love to hear about them. Oh, uh, well, my, my research takes place primarily in Mexico City. I'm a global health researcher. Um, I'm very interested in the interrelationships between neurotoxic environmental factors. That would include toxic metals like lead or mercury or arsenic. Uh, but also things like air pollution and how they actually may cause both um, neurotoxicity and later on in life cause obesity. So my research is actually looking at whether or not chemicals that we think are neurotoxic, um, lead is a good example, um, actually produce um, toxicity that's measurable in children when they're school age, say five to 10, but before they develop obesity and that one of the forms of neurotoxicity they have is actually changing their eating behavior. So eating is driven by your brain. And if a chemical is neurotoxic, it may affect the way you eat. And I think that my, one of my hypotheses is that these chemicals actually cause neurotoxicity, which might be measured in cognitive deficits or other types of neurobehavioral tests, but also change the way we eat and actually make it more likely that we're going to develop obesity around the time they hit uh, a child hits adolescence. So that's what my research uh, is. And I, I think our, our initial findings are actually bearing that out. Um, some of our faculty are studying the effect of toxic metals on um, vaccine response. So I think that's particularly important uh, you know, in this era of uh, the pandemic uh, and you know, mass um, vaccination uh, against um, COVID. Uh, if there are environmental factors that make you more likely to not respond to the vaccine, I think that's important information to know. So some of our faculty are actually doing research on that as well. Um, so I think there's a lot of uh, really interesting work happening around uh, the effects of climate and health. Uh, Alan Just is doing a lot of work, um, actually using partnering with NASA to use NASA satellites to measure um, health, or excuse me, measure uh, weather variables such as temperature and how those affect health and to hopefully come up with programs to protect the most vulnerable people like the elderly or the very young who are probably most sensitive to, to climate effects. Thank you so much, Dr. Wright. Thank you very much for a wonderful opening presentation. Before we close, we'd like to ask you to complete an evaluation survey. You can take an image of the QR code on the screen and it will take you 
to the survey. We'll also email you a copy if you are registered and we have your email on file. We hope that you will join us next Wednesday for our next talk with uh, Dr. Scott Shisherer, who is a leading physician scientist who's studying pediatric food allergies here at Mount Sinai. So with that, I know we're a few minutes over, but thank you again for coming and enjoy the rest of your day.